Yeah, so let's get started. Um, so yeah, first of all, I'd like to start by thanking Neo4j for having me. Um, we were a part of, well, we went to GraphConnect London in May and it was such a good day that, um, you know, I'm super excited to be able to be a part of it today. Um, so I'm Irene, I'm a data scientist for Gusto and I'm going to be telling you a little bit about how we decipher our recipes, what that actually means, uh, and why it's something that we want to be doing. So, just going to quickly start with an introduction to Gusto. Um, so, in a nutshell, we're an online recipe box service. Uh, we're based in the UK, so a customer can come to our, uh, to our website, they have a weekly menu, they can pick um, up to four recipes from that menu, they pick how many uh, people they want to cook these meals for, what day they want it delivered. Um, and then on their chosen day, a nice uh, you know, box arrives at their door with all the exactly measured ingredients and step by simple to follow, step by step um, recipe cards. So you know, it kind of takes uh, the planning away from it, the having to go buy groceries. Um, and quite importantly, we think it gets rid of a lot of food waste. So, there's no more, you know, going to the supermarket and getting a big bag of carrots when actually you're going to use two carrots or buying, you know, a, a bottle, an expensive bottle of an obscure ingredient that actually you're going to use a tablespoon of. Um, and yeah, and it's, you know, tasty, fun recipes. So we think that actually you just get to do the fun bit, which is to cook and to eat those recipes. Um, so I'm guessing a lot of you are probably familiar with the concept. You know, over here you've got Blue Apron, HelloFresh and, and lots of others. Um, but yeah, at the moment we're only based in the, in the UK. Um, so we're really kind of basing our proposition around choice. Uh, so we're like market leaders by offering 22 different recipes on our weekly menu. Um, and within those, we always make sure to have enough uh, gluten-free options, enough dairy-free options, enough vegetarian options. Um, you know, and you can mix and match from all of them. So you can really tailor it to what, uh, whatever your needs are. Um, we also offer delivery seven days a week, uh, which, you know, some of them you can choose morning slots, evening slots. So it's really, um, you know, kind of based on around the customer and trying to give them as much flexibility as possible in, in using us. Um, so yeah, that's us in a nutshell. Um, before I go any forward, you know, I'd really like to stress that I'm lucky to be presenting here today, but this is all our data science uh, team and it's kind of all their work. So Dan is our team lead. And then we've got Mark, Manuel, Kat and myself. Um, and yeah, this is also obviously their work. Um, so at uh, Gusto, yeah, we have the data science team, uh, which, you know, we're, we're in charge of more long-term projects. So, uh, you know, building like, algorithms that support the business in certain ways that I'll go into a bit more detail in a minute. Um, and we've also got analytics, which support the business in more kind of ad hoc ways. So perhaps, uh, you know, optimizing a conversion funnel or really looking into how customers are reacting to different uh, discounts. Um, so yeah, they're a bit more ad hoc stuff. But overall, we're like, you know, we really want to be a data-driven company and everyone is really encouraged to to learn SQL. You know, learning SQL at Gusto is an asset because it means, you know, they don't have to depend on us. The data is there, um, you know, obviously within constraints. Um, so yeah, data is a really important part of, of our business. Um, so just wanted to really quickly touch upon our data journey. So we're five years old. Um, we started with our data journey quite early on, even though that was, you know, kind of external data sources like Google Analytics, there was a lot of ad hoc Excel requests, you know, when the CEO kind of asked for something. Um, but, you know, there, there was a lack of being able to really track our customers and understand how they were interacting with us. Um, so pretty early on, we decided that, you know, we think data is going to make quite a big difference uh, to us and perhaps differentiate us from our competitors. So let's, you know, really invest in it and create a rich, uh, data kind of ecosystem that can support us. Um, so this is what it looks like at the moment. So our main data warehouse is Amazon Redshift. Um, we use Periscope as our BI visualization tool that you know, all the business kind of has access to. 
Um, we use Salesforce as our integrated CRM system, which uh, you know kind of really allows us to see who's opened what email and stuff like this. Um, we've got Airflow from Airbnb um, to support our, our ETL processes in terms of scheduled emails that go out every morning um, and a few more other things. Then we've also got Snowplow, uh, which basically collects all the information about all the clicks on the website. So we know exactly which customers have clicked where, for how long they've clicked for, um, where they've come from. So it really gives us a really granular view of how our customers interact uh, with our website. And obviously last, but by no means least, uh, we've got Neo4j, which is, going, uh, which is what I'm going to be explaining to you today. So we use Neo4j to be able to calculate uh, the similarity between our different recipes. Um, we've done this by putting an ontology into Neo4j, and hopefully what I'm going to be able to do today, or what I'm going to try, is to explain the background a little bit of what our problem really was and why we came to, to this kind of solution. So yeah, kind of this is data science in the business, but how does data actually affect our product? You know, what are the end results? Um, so I've built quite a simple customer journey. So, uh, you know, our customer will see us. We've just launched a TV ad. Um, it'll come on the website, so either or the app or on whatever device they want. Uh, they will place that order, and this then needs to be fulfilled in our fulfillment center in Lincolnshire. Um, and once that box is ready, it will be shipped to your door, and you will get your box, and you'll hopefully really enjoy your recipe. Um, so I just kind of wanted to show a few uh, points at which data science actually plays a role in the, in the end product. Um, so as I mentioned before, we just launched a TV ad, but that's by no means like the only method of, of marketing. We've got you know, Facebook. We've got handing um, flyers out at stations. Um, so the, the, actually, the customer needs a bit more than once to, to be convinced. Um, so we've built a marketing attribution model that looks at um, you know, the different uptakes of those different channels, that looks at how those channels are affecting each other. Um, and effectively, what it, it gives us is a way of how we should be spending our marketing spend, in what proportion and to which channels, to make sure that we're getting as many customers, but not only as many, but the best that we can get. So people who are going to you know, stay with us and, and use us um, in the long term. So yeah, that's kind of marketing attribution. And then once we come to the website, um, so obviously you come to the website and there's a long list of, of recipes available. Um, but because we have a really short lead time which of, of three days, so from you placing your order to getting the box is three days um, minimum we cannot buy to, to orders. So we need uh, a way to order before, um, order before all the orders are placed. And you know, kind of once we run out, we run out. Um, so this is why we've built a, a forecasting uh, model. So this model kind of takes into account different inputs. So acquisition, how strong do we think acquisition is looking that week, which is affected by all kinds of things from you know, weather to, um, to holidays. Um, we take into account, uh, we do cohort analysis on all of our customers and use kind of probabilistic theories. Um, and we look at like live customer trends from that week. So how, you know, w when are people buying what? Um, so in the end, this gives us a, a total number of boxes that we can then, um, we then actually need to convert into buying, you know, from this number of boxes, we think we need to buy this number of, you know, chickens. Um, so because there's 22 recipes and customers can pick their, their recipes, they're not all as popular as each other. So you know, we know that a salad normally performs less than chicken noodles. Um, so you know, we're going to have to buy more of, that, um, of those noodles. So you know, we're trying to build a sustainable business. So we really want to nail this um, and make sure that we're not creating any unnecessary food waste. But at the same time, we want to make sure that we're giving our customers as much variety as, as we can. Um, so yeah, we're constantly kind of tuning this model and adapting to, to what's going on. Um, then we also got a stock manipulation system, uh, which, as I mentioned before, we have different types of memberships uh, of like subscription to our service, each with different, um, you know, different kind of constraints, like gluten-free or vegetarian. 
And stock manipulation is an algorithm that kind of constantly runs in the background, ensuring that we are fitting those, like we are fulfilling those constraints. You know, our customers with constraints aren't going to not get their recipes, while at the same time kind of maximizing the amount of, of recipes that everyone can see. Um, so yeah, that's kind of on the website. Once the customer has placed their order, uh, we've got their recipes, we go into the fulfillment center. So uh, there we have a warehouse optimization system. Uh, so this uses genetic algorithms to ensure that we are picking the boxes as efficiently and as quickly as possible. So we have on average, I think it's about 50 unique SKUs, so around 50 different items in each box. And again, they all come with like certain constraints. You know, you don't want to put a tomato, oh, oh no. Uh, you don't want to put a tomato at the bottom of a box. Um, oh, spoiler alert. Um, you don't want to put the tomato at the bottom of a box and then put a t tin of beans on top because that's probably going to squish the tomato. So th th there's a lot of things like this that, that yeah, the warehouse optimization algorithm takes into account to ensure that we're picking, that we're picking as efficiently as we can. Um, so these are all kind of what we've been doing, but what we're really kind of focusing on and what we think is really going to make a big difference is, is closing, clo being able to close that loop. So ensuring that what you're having at home, the recipes that you're picking, the ratings that you're giving these recipes are actually going to affect the experience that you're getting of us as a whole. And I guess what we're talking about really is personalization. So this is what, um, you know, yeah, I foresee the immediate future as focusing on and to kind of really tightening the circle and ensuring that we're giving our customers as personalized a service as possible. So I kind of wanted to touch a little bit upon what we think of when we say personalization. So this is what our website looks like. Um, you see at the top, you've got like a lot of collections, so family friendly, quick and easy. So we think, what you want is to land on this page and get a for you. We think you want to land on this page and see exactly what we think you're going to enjoy. Um, you know, some people love, you know, scrolling through pictures of food. I know I'm one of them. Um, you know, I'll happily look through all the recipes, but, but that's not everyone. And a lot of people use this because they're busy. And I think it's really important for us to be able to say, hey, you know, this is a condensed list, choose from this, have meaningful choice that, you know, kind of isn't overwhelming for the sake of it being overwhelming. Um, we think it's also not just the website, but every kind of communication point we have with you. So we want to ensure we personalize our, our CRM. You know, we don't want to send you irrelevant information that, you know, you're not going to um, appreciate. We want to send you recipes that are appealing to you with information that is going to be useful for you. Um, then we've got default customers. So default customers are people who are on a subscription but have not actually chosen the recipes uh, that week. So at the moment, they kind of automatically get allocated um, recipes by our chefs. However, you know, obviously that doesn't work as well for, any, you know, for everyone. So we've seen that when these customers, who are a significant proportion, um, are actually happy with their allocated choice, they show better retention. So really, giving them personalized recipes is a win-win. Is a you know, for them, they don't need to worry about going onto the website and picking their recipes if that's not what they want. Um, they can be sure that Gusto's gonna like, take care of it and send, send them recipes that, that they enjoy. Um, so what I really wanna say with this is that we think of personalization as a bit uh, you know, broader than just recommending recipes. So it's involved in the merchandising, it's involved in how we sell you our service, but obviously, um, recommending recipes is a huge part of it. So I'm just really quickly going to, um, going to go through uh, the two main recommendation systems, uh, which I'm sure a lot of you know already, but just uh, really quickly. So we've got collaborative filtering. Um, so this one, if we've got Mark the Graph superhero who's ordered, uh, you know, sea bass and some chicken, like Italian chicken, and some pro linguine. So we know this about uh, Mark. But also then we've got Emil, and we know that he's actually ordered the, the fish, and he's ordered the pro linguine. 
So what we can say is, you know, actually these two customers seem fairly similar. So they've both ordered those two recipes. So take a simple step and just recommend that other dish that Mark has uh, ordered to Emil. So this is, yeah, kind of collaborative filtering, and it's based on finding similar users and recommending stuff that is similar to, to that user. So it's got, um, you know, several pros. So for each recommendation, you actually know that you've got several data points. Um, you know, that was an example with only one user that we were basing it on, but normally you'd have clusters of users that you can, uh, you know, that you can use to make those recommendations. Um, in terms of cons, we've got cold start, which is uh, kind of refers to the concept of recommender systems struggling with, um, you know, for example, in this case, recommending recipes to a new user. If, the new, if it's a new user, we have no information to base anything on. We don't know what it's going to be, what he's going to be similar to. Um, and we've got sparsity. So because we've got quite a you know, large collection of recipes and you can't actually pick all of them, you're gonna, each user is going to have interacted with, with only a few of those. Um, so this is collaborative filtering, and then we've actually got uh, content-based filtering. So again, we've got uh, ML, and we know that he's ordered the prawn linguine from before. We can say, well, actually, there's another uh, recipe on the menu this week that is pasta-based. Um, so based on the fact that these two are relatively similar, we're just going to recommend uh, that to him. So content-based is, is based on the, on the items, in this case, the, the recipes. So a big pro is that the cold start problem that we were just discussing, this is not going to be the case for recipes. You know, we, we have the, the new recipe attributes. Um, we can compare it to an old recipe. So it, it's going to be easy enough to recommend that. Whereas in collaborative filtering, if that recipe has never been ordered, we cannot recommend it for now. Um, however, on the con side, we've actually got not much information sharing amongst users, so we've got perhaps slightly more subtle um, kind of user behavior that, that we're not going to capture with uh, content-based. There's large amount of, yeah, you're missing out on serendipity, so, you know, if customers are always kind of ordering pasta and they're actually also ordering curries with this um, method, you might just actually end up uh, recommending pasta when you know s similar users also use curry. So there's that amount of getting something different that is um, isn't such a a thing with content-based filtering. So basically, we've got the two methods. Um, there's pros and there's cons to to both of them. So the perfect solution is to get the best of both worlds. Um, so to get the best of both worlds is what it's called a hybrid uh, recommender system, which actually takes bits from one and bits from the other um, and, and uses it all to you know, balance the pros and cons of, of each one. So the hybrid model that we've been using um, is a recommender developed by Mache Kula at List. Um, so it's called Light FM. And it's just like uh, the paper where he explains everything and he's got a really cool talk about recommender systems as well, which I'd recommend. Um, so if anyone you know, wants more info later, just come and speak to me. Um, but yeah, basically this is the, the recommender that, that we're using. So just quickly to recap the cold style problem, which again we've said is like a, quite a big deal. So what we've decided to do for new users is when you sign up to our service, we're going to show you uh, five to ten uh, optional, because not, you know, not everyone has time for this, but five to ten optional recipe battles where you'll be able to say, right, actually, I prefer this one over this one, and kind of it will whittle down to, to having some idea about this user. So then we can go and do uh, collaborative filtering. You know, we know what people that have chosen like you uh, have ended up ordering, um, and we can do content-based. So we know re we can recommend you recipes that are similar to the ones you've picked because we know that it's what you like. Um, so yeah, this is in terms of new users, and in, in terms of new recipes, if we as we've discussed before, um, it's all about getting the similarity from those recipe properties. So 
yeah, the example we had before, you know, we're both kind of Italian-based, they're both pasta, they're both non-vegetarians, so we can make, you know, an assumption that uh, they will like the other. So hopefully you can kind of see where I'm going with this um, and what our challenge is. So our main challenge is we need to be able to put a similarity score to those recipes based on, those uh, based on their properties for content-based filtering. Now, food is really quite subjective. Um, and evokes, you know, quite, like, quite strong feelings of people. If anyone's ever watched, you know, a MasterChef episode and how, you know, <laughs> differing opinions people have. Um, so, yeah, kind of capturing all of that is quite hard. So, thought I'd do like a little example. So, these are two dishes from the past menus. So we've got Brazilian black beans and limey chicken with rice, and we've got Cambodian chicken, Sam la curry with rice. So just, I'm just like, you know, show of hands, gut feeling, who would say that these two recipes are similar? Okay, some people um, both have rice, yeah, okay, super good point. Um, but yeah, some, you know, dubious hands, it's, it, it's a complicated question. Um, so, you know, if we think about it from someone who's adventure-based, someone who uses our service because, you know, they're a bit stuck in a rut of cooking the same things kind of over and over again, and they want to challenge themselves to, to eat perhaps, you know, slightly more exciting stuff. So maybe they'll look at these two dishes that are on the menu the same week and go, well, actually, you know, what I've highlighted, one's Brazilian, one's Cambodian, they're both quite far away in terms of geography. These two dishes have got different uh, flavor profiles. So, you know, I'm eating two different things this week. I'd happily put both of them into my, um, into my box. Um, so yeah, they say, yeah, no, not similar, not a problem. Um, however, if we come at it from someone who's perhaps using our service because they really want to make sure that they're giving their, uh, their family kind of a, a varied and healthy diet and you know, they're interested in the more wholesome aspects of this. Um, yeah, they might look at what, what you said, you know, well, actually, at the end of the day, they might be different cuisines, but they're both chicken and rice, and I don't want to give my kids uh, two chicken and rice dishes. I'd like them to eat some fish, or I'd like to eat some pasta. So, again, kind of really depends on why you're using our service and, and what, um, yeah, just, just different aspects of it. Um, then we've also got another two, so beanie tacos with sweet corn and chorizo and sweet potato fries, and pork, pineapple, and red onion tacos. So, you know, we can probably all agree that they are quite similar, you know, they're both tacos, they're both a bit meaty, um, but, you know, perhaps someone who's got young kids and they want to start getting them to eat, all eat the same thing. Um, I mean, correct, I don't have any kids, so do correct me if I'm wrong, but to me it feels that, you know, sweet corn and sweet potato fries are probably more accessible to, to the kids in terms of flavor and in terms of excitement, whereas pickled red onions is perhaps not the best introduction for them to, to Mexican food. But yeah, again, I might be completely wrong, but this is just something else that, that we need to, to think about because a large, uh, you know, portion of our customers are family, uh, families. Um, but then, if we're looking at it from the point of convenience, someone who, you know, is using our service because they get home very late, they're very busy, um, they need quick 20 minute dishes that are, you know, they don't want to get takeaway or whatever, um, probably see the sweet potato fries and you know they're going to be in the oven for like 35, 40 minutes that's probably not going to be like a super quick um, meal. So you might be tempted to go for the other uh, tacos. So, I mean, yeah, I think what I want to say with this is that there's, um, you know, there's actually a lot of stuff to think about with, um, with food. So we could have a basic recipe similarity score through simply comparing what ingredients are in both recipes. But we think that that's not, that's not good enough for our purposes. We, we really want to be able to capture the slightly more subtle, the slightly more subjective uh, aspects of it all. So, yeah, for example, we want to take into account what cuisine it is. 
you want to take into account what type of dish it is, which is, you know, harder to actually classify than one would think. Um, how is this recipe kind of uh, presented in our, uh, in our website? Because that will have an effect on the similarity. And why is the customer using our service, as I've discussed? So, you know, kind of this is like the explanation of the whole problem that obviously leads us to our solution, which is, um, you know, Neo4j coming to the rescue. So what we kind of decided to do was, um, you know, to introduce an ontology, which I never heard of before, so I'm just going to, you know, quickly run through the definition. So it's a formal naming and definition of the types, properties, and interrelationships of the entities that fundamentally exist for a particular domain. So what that means for us is putting all our, you know, all our recipes and all our ingredients uh, and kind of joining them together. So deciding what are the types, so the recipe, the ingredient itself, what are the interrelationships that, that are there that, that kind of describe the whole thing. So because we wanted more than just a taxonomy, more than just, you know, kind of chicken breast as part of chicken, uh, we've got in interesting relationships such as, you know, recipe has ingredient, ingredient. Um, we, yeah, we thought that Neo4j was the obvious uh, solution. So just a little bit more in detail. So why did we choose Neo4j? Um, so yeah, as I've just discussed, obviously, recipe and the ingredient attributes are all really highly interconnected. You know, we've got the recipe that is actually made up of the ingredients. Those ingredients normally kind of define what, um, what cuisine it is. Uh, that cuisine, a lot of the time, then leads to what type of dish is it. So everything is incredibly um, connected, like in real life. You know, food is complicated, it's messy. Um, and in order for us to be able to capture those different point of views, it was super important for us to be able to approach um, all the relations, so kind of come at the recipes from a lot of different angles, uh, which Neo4j kind of was the perfect um, tool to do this. But apart from this, apart from the fact it was highly interconnected, we found some kind of quite yeah, practical other bits. Um, so it allowed us to define a really flexible structure for our recipes and our ingredients. So, you know, for example, we had uh, ingredient chili that we could easily give an attribute spicy without having to worry about anything else having that attribute spicy. Um, something really important to us as well was um, being able to give attributes to those relations. So, we, we love fusion and gusto. It's always, you know, crazy combinations. Um, so say we have like a chicken katsu burger, we could easily say, okay, well actually, this has both um, cuisine American and Japanese, but actually it's probably 75% American and 25% Japanese. So this was, um, yeah, really useful for us to be able to capture this, which we were struggling to do before. And, uh, and we can then use this for, you know, slightly more clever similarity uh, scores. Um, we could also really easily create inferences from the data, so it kind of allowed us to be a bit more clever and almost get, get more out of the data that we already had. So, say we had, um, you know, a recipe that contained this ingredient chili that we'd tagged as spicy before. We could say, right, anything that's got that spicy ingredient, we're going to probably tag as non-kid friendly. So th there was a lot of stuff that, it, you know, kind of reduced manual errors and that kind of helped our recipe developers as well have to tag less things. But we could still, you know, by tagging less, we still got more. So, um, so yeah, that was super important to us and, and really helped us. Um, so once we've kind of got this, which we're still in the process, as I'll tell you about in a minute, um, you know, how do we actually go from having this uh, ontology and this structure to actually calculating similarities? Um, so we're playing around with it. We've got, you know, two different methods, if anything. So we've got our supervised um, methods where we can use tagged data. So, you know, we know how two recipes um, are connected to each other and different attributes, so by cuisine, or by ingredients shared, or by, um, you know, uh, 
many other things. So we could use that tag data to actually plug it into our system and be able to calculate those weights. You know, it's probably not super important to a recipe similarity that two recipes have uh, garlic in them. You know, a lot of cuisines, a lot of stuff has garlic. Um, but it is probably important that they're the same cuisine. Um, so, yeah, kind of this was one, this is one approach we're playing with. Um, and then we've got an unsupervised approach, so kind of using techniques like clustering um, and things like this, to, which we then used our tag data to actually validate the model. So, yeah, at the moment I'm using tag data, which I'll go to in, in a minute, but you know, kind of the end goal and what we want to do uh, fairly quickly is actually use what our customers are ordering and what they're not ordering and what they're rating those recipes as our actual feedback. You know, if we know how well we're doing by what people are rating, what people are perhaps, you know, not liking, um, then we'll be able to train the model even better. But, you know, we're, we're not there yet. Um, so this tag data that I was kind of referring to, um, so in order to kind of benchmark our similarity scores or use it to train the model, um, was actually coming from humans. And the way we did this was uh, we set up our recipe bot on Gusto's Lack. So every couple of hours, um, it would kind of send you two recipes and say, OK, rate from one to five. How, um, you know, how similar are they? So you know, when she did it, it was wait a, a bit because you know, we couldn't all be just doing this. Um, but we made it into a bit of a competition. And as with everything, you know, everyone gets a little bit more motivated like that. So you could check how many times you'd responded and how you ranked uh, in terms of the company and how many you had to pick the person before. So with this, we you know, actually gathered thousands and thousands of answers, which you know, we're kind of now using to, we're now starting to, to leverage. Um, so yeah, this is kind of where we are. It's all very much a work in progress. Um, we, you know, it kind of requires a lot of recipe tagging again to make sure that we've got the information in the correct structure and there's not, you know, free text and stuff. Um, but, you know, we're playing around with it and hopefully, you know, I look forward to presenting, you know, more concrete results um, about this to you uh, at some point. Um, so, yeah, this is kind of where we are. And I just wanted to, like, quickly finish with what I think, you know, I think Neo, this is the start of Gusto and Neo4j uh, kind of working together. So we've got, you know, we came back from Graph Connect London and suddenly there was this, you know, huge amount of ideas. So we're thinking, you know, could we actually take personalization one step further with Snowplow data? So as I mentioned earlier, earlier Snowplow um, kind of allows us to go gets us really granular um, activity on the website. So when did people click? Where did people click? Where did those people come from? Um, so can we actually use this for personalization? Even, even before they're placing the, their orders, can we you know, look at perhaps they're only clicking on like a certain, you know, perhaps they're only clicking on curries. So can we actually use this, um, use this to recommend recipes? Or you know, are they really kind of exploring or different cuisines, so should we reflect this in their, in their experience? So, so yeah, I think big plans with this. Um, we also think that the ontology could help us when like substituting kind of problematic ingredients for dietary requirements. So say you've got um, you know, a pasta dish that is absolutely gluten-free, apart from the fact that it's got pasta. So if that pasta kind of had a relation that was like, gluten-free substitute is gluten-free pasta. So hopefully our um, customers could just kind of click on a thing and say, right, actually, I want to make this gluten-free. So it's increasing that flexibility that we were talking about at the beginning kind of even more. Um, and then, you know, kind of really thinking outside the box, uh, we've got a little robot chef here. So can we do any AI-based recipe development? You know, can we, can we use the ontology to suggest our recipe developers. You know, you've only got two um, Scandi-inspired recipes, but they're doing, you know, they've got a huge uptake, like, we should create more of this. Or, you know, these two ingredients always together always seem to get super high um, 
you know, rating, how can we uh, leverage this? So, yeah, I think overall it's the fact that I think everyone at Gusto is kind of like super excited about this. You know, we have a thing called Tech 10% where for 10% of our time we do kind of different projects. And the other day I was just walking around and someone was using uh, Neo4j to create a little wine pairing thing. So, yeah, everyone's super excited. And I think, um, yeah, this is the start of the journey and hopefully we'll have more exciting things to show you. Um, so yeah, kind of that's all for me. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, this is our, our Twitter. You know, we kind of keep up to date with us if you'd like to. And then we've got our blog Tech Brunch, um, where we go a little bit more in depth about kind of what it's like to be uh, to work for Gusto in tech. Um, and yeah, any questions? I'll be around or now or whatever. <laughs>